Well, Good evening, well, everybody. And again, thank you for, for showing up and being here. Um, if this, uh, to, to the people who are watching, uh, if this is the first time you're watching one of these meetings, I urge you to view uh, some or all of the earlier meeting uh, videos. They're on the city's YouTube page. Um, there you'll find some additional framing comments and you can hear comments that the public have, uh, have, has offered. Uh, please understand that the committee is still in a listening mode. No conclusions have been drawn at this point and none will be until we finish these listening sessions tonight. Uh, we are not looking at this uh, in collaborative as a one and done event. We uh, do not see reinventing as an event, uh, we see it as a process. So uh, we're not approaching this as something that concludes once the report is submitted to the state. In some form or another, there will be an organized and ongoing dialogue that will involve uh, stakeholders and the community. And I think this is critical if we're looking to build uh, enduring trust and effective responses to the needs of our community. This PRRC is one step in a process, a process that started well before the summer uh, and will continue well past April 1st. The purpose of these meetings is to receive input from the community, but it is not the only way uh, to interact with the committee. We strongly encourage written comments. Any written comments submitted will be sh shared with all committee members. They'll be posted on the website and they will become part of the written record. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our Chief of Police, Brian Owens, to say a few words. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Owens, and I'd like to thank everyone for being a part of this meeting tonight. Some of you may know me, Deputy Chief Dan DeWolf, and Assistant Chief Chris Keene, personally and professionally. We have worked closely with people throughout the neighborhoods of Troy for many years, and that has continued in our current roles. Detroit Police Department is a full service New York State accredited law enforcement agency. Some of you have likely interacted with the men and women of our department, whether in the ordinary course of your life as a result of a call for service or during a serious incident. We are fortunate to have caring members who are willing and dedicated to serving others. We demonstrate this through our actions and attitudes every hour of every day during thousands of interactions each year. There are countless instances of our members offering life changing and even life-saving assistance to people we encounter. We are grateful for the strong support of our community members and strive to not only keep people safe from crime, but to also help people in ways big and small. We're also fortunate to have our partners on the committee and the people and resources that your organizations offer to the people of Troy and beyond. Through this series of meetings and others, the Troy Police Department has had ongoing conversations and collaborated with our community, including the neighborhoods and organizations represented by the speakers and committee members for many years, in some cases, decades. We have evolved over time to better serve the people of our city, and we welcome this ongoing dialogue to find better ways to improve as a police department. We also look forward to continuing to listen to members of our community on ways to address issues of crime, disorder, and injustice. Our goal is to make Troy a healthier, better, and safer city. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our facilitator for this meeting, uh, Tamara Gatschel. Tamara has uh, worked with us on the design uh, and uh, facilitation of these meetings. She's been a great help to us. Uh, she is familiar with the community. She has worked uh, with uh, Fred Miller at Khalil Jameson over the years. And um, I thank her for helping us bring this together. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Tamara, at this time. Thank you, Mayor. It's good to be here with you this evening. Uh, John, if you wanna pull up the agenda, we can take a look at what we have uh, for this evening. Uh, we've had our welcoming comments from the mayor and from Police Chief Owens. I will cover some process guidelines. And then tonight we have an affinity group meeting um, and we're gonna be hearing, our focus is around youth um, tonight. And so we have uh, Patrick Doyle is here from the Boys and Girls Club, so we welcome him. And then also Dr. Antonio Abatabale, and I, I hope I didn't murder that too badly, um, the Lansingburg superintendent. So they're gonna share some perspective uh, with us this evening. And then we will also hear from the Troy Police Department. Uh, Chief Owens will be 
sharing some about how the police department is working today and some of his perspective along with his team. And then we'll go into a committee debrief for about 15 minutes and we'll wrap up sometime around 8.15. So just some quick process notes for this evening. Um, I think everyone knows and we wanna make sure that we're muting when we're not speaking and you can use star six if you're on a phone to mute and unmute. There will be no public comments at this meeting but if you do have comments and recommendations that you'd like to share with the committee, you can still do that through email and through postal mail through the 1st of March. And then all of the committee meetings are being live streamed on the Troy YouTube channel and they're being recorded. So if you missed a meeting and wanna go back and uh, watch, they are on the website. So what I will do at this point in time is I'll turn it over um, to, I think we're going to start with Patrick this evening. And we welcome you to, to share with the committee. Thank you for being with us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, so uh, personally, I've worked for the Boys and Girls Club for the past 20 years. Um, we've had um, on and off relationships with uh, police leagues. Um, so personally, I think that is a great way for the youth to uh, build that positive relationship with our police officers, um, having the police officers become coaches and role models, which I know we've had in the past. I know that, you know, not everyone might have the time to invest, but I think that by investing in the youth early, it will help our policing in our community uh, later on in life um, by just building those positive relationships. Um, we've had several police officers come, um, like I said, you know, more of the basketball leagues. It gets the, you know, the police interacting with our youth, with our community, uh, which is definitely something that's positive uh, for our community. And we have seen that, um, you know, throughout my 20, 20 plus years uh, working at the organization. Um, but I think from a youth perspective, you know, building that trust and that bond with the police officer um, and also the education component with our youth. So how can police officers, boys and girls clubs and other agencies uh, take a step forward by facilitating programs? Of, um, I know Jerry Ford has, has done this in the past. Um, having those relationships and those open dialogues with our teams, uh, properly talking um, when, when questioning or, you know, when something happens, who to go to, who's the person that they can go to and they can trust um, uh, in the department or in the community. So um, I do look forward to helping out uh, moving forward, however I possibly can uh, with this initiative and, you know, basically to strengthen the relationship with our youth um, in our community and the police department. Patrick, can you just share what that program is that you mentioned just for those that might not be familiar with it? Yeah, so in the past, um, uh, so police athletic leagues are, are um, you know, are bigger in other cities. Um, I know funding is, is a major priority, but um, uh, even Chief Owens was uh, at the table just a few months ago about a boxing program, which we opened up at, at Grizzle Heights. So, you know, um, just being there and supporting uh, what, what the youth are doing, the programs and the positive uh, nature that they're having. So a lot of them are, are called police athletic leagues, um, PAL. Um, but for us, it was just more of a, a drop-in. So um, Officer Collington used to have a relationship where he'd come across the street and, um, you know, bring some other police officers with him. And there'll just be, you know, even some just pickup games, you know, just to, just so the police would build that uh, bond with, with our youth. Thank you. You're welcome. So Patrick, do you want us to turn it over to questions at this point and we can have sure, a committee? Yeah. Sure, okay. Um, does anyone have, have a question for Patrick? Deputy Mayor. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I, it's no secret that you and I have been working together for uh, a few years now trying to do summer camp programming and the pool programming and stuff like that. And I guess my question to you and one of the things that we've always talked about as we've brought in, as we've brought in, as we as we've brought the the youth agencies together, we have the social service agencies and, and the groups here, but not necessarily the full aspect of the youth agencies. What do you think is missing? when we come to youth and, and engagement and you're talking about intervention, prevention, activity, education, what do you think as a city we're missing that we need to fill those voids or attempt to start filling those voids? 
I think a lot of it is a, a siloed approach. Um, so everyone has specialties. Uh, every agency has a specialty and there's not a lot of collaboration. So, you know, rather than having one big youth, you know, having maybe a, a staff member in the city that oversees, which I know I did see this on the budget this year, but having someone that oversees, you know, and brings everyone together um, for, for events. Um, I think it's a lot of siloed um, approach, um, which, which in essence leads to duplication of some services, but, you know, missing other services in our city. And a large part of that is, is a funding, you know, if, you know, and, and with our donors, we see it too. If a donor gives $5,000 to 10 different organizations, it might be All a right. better bet to give $50,000 to one. So you could have somebody, you know, you could hire a person. Um, so you're, you're investing in the person in the community. Yeah. And we kind of saw that with the summer programming where we, we were able to pool together a bunch of funding and then be able to kind of do programs and, and bring different agencies together to do different sites in different locations. So yeah. Um, what about the, what about the teenagers? Let's talk about like the, you know, we've had conversations on this panel about like the 15, maybe 14, even 15 to, you know, 19 year olds. Um, what do you guys do at the boys and girls clubs with that age group? But also, is there something that outside of snug or anything like that? And snug operates a different a model, but what else, what else do you think we could do with that age range? Um, yeah, so we are launching, you'll be seeing, we're launching a workforce development, special, uh, especially just for uh, residents in Rensselaer County. Um, last year, it was a multifaceted uh, capital area approach. So it allows us now to invest two staff members uh, to reach for workforce development. Uh, we did have a success rate last year from October to December of having seven um, young adults hired, in, in, which is which is great for our community. Um, so I think... Uh, Moving forward, it is definitely, it's a focus of the Boys and Girls Club, but it has been for the past few years. Uh, what we say is when, when youth turn 12, they're still at the Boys and Girls Club, but then from the 13 to 15 is where we lose them. Um, so it's what programs, what can you offer them? How can you change your model? Um, so something we did launch is, you know, even having an arcade room, you know, something like that, just to bring them in, you know, get them off the streets. But I think it, it's the um, positive mentors in their lives, you know, uh, we are fortunate. We have a lot of great mentors at our facilities that bring the kids in. So that's what the kids come for. It's, it's the interactions. Kevin. Hey, Patrick. Thanks. Thanks for the work that you do. Uh, it's been a heck of a year. Uh, there has been a spike in gun, gun violence that's affected youth uh, and neighborhoods. And that's not new, but, but certainly, certainly going on. Um, and um, you mentioned before about, uh, and, and, and I don't know if it was a wish or, or, or it's a hope uh, about police engagement. Uh, uh, you, you were talking about open dialogues and, uh, and, and who to go to when incidents happen. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Because there's, there's been, you know, the George Floyd uh, discussions this past spring, you know, a lot of other events that have occurred over the year, over years, actually. Um, what opportunities have there been with an engagement of the police to have those open dialogue discussions? And what can you recommend to, to, to enhance them? Yeah, so um, Jerry Ford and Team Hero and the Boys and Girls Club partnered, I believe it's about a year and a half ago now, uh, yeah, definitely before COVID. Um, and there was, there was an open, uh, there were four um, police officers on a panel and the teens came in, parents would come in and just actually just talk and just say what's going on. Um, so I think it was a great opportunity for the police department, the city come together. Um, um, as we see, everyone needs to work on something, uh, you know, definitely for to make something positive uh, happen in our community. So I think moving forward, it could be something uh, definitely post COVID where we have an opportunity to have these discussions, uh, you know, throughout the city too, you know, uh, because again, transportation is a huge factor for a lot of programs we run for the families we serve. So how do we, you know, in a safe manner during COVID as well, but also, um, you know, so, hey, maybe at the seventh app park, we'll go and on this day, we'll have some, you know, light refreshments, we'll talk and just say what's going on, like what's going on in the community, how can we build it, but also having that police presence there to, you know, to showcase that, that everyone here is a human, you know, um, while there are mistakes, there's also ways to, you know, um, to get to the end result. So 
I think uh, moving forward, that would be something that we definitely would want to help out with, assist with, and uh, as far as from the youth perspective, but I think come together as a city with. Renee? Yes. Hi, Patrick. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your funding? Is it strictly from donations? Do you get government funding, um, state, local, federal? Could you explain your, your funding setup? Yeah, so uh, so uh, we are now Boys and Girls from the Capital area. When we were just Troy, we relied heavily on um, grants, which is not a great model to have. Uh, so actually, when I took over as CEO, we tried to diversify our funding because, again, it's it's great to have a, a ambitious and say, hey, we're going to do this. And then a year later, the grant runs out. And then what do you do? A uh, prime example this year was our workforce development program. We didn't reach our numbers because of COVID, but since it was federal funding, it's you didn't reach your numbers, the money is not going to be there for you for this following year. So it's us finding, you know, finding other uh, partners, um, other ways. So uh, a thing that we've done since our merger uh, to form the Boys and Cap area is to have a, um, a more diversified, um, uh, I guess, portfolio. Um, so uh, and to, to save to save some money and but also to, um, to to invest it back into our staff. Like we said, all of our staff come from the community. So you know, every dollar that comes through our doors yeah. goes back into the community some 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 way, some shape, some 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 form. You know, it's not going away from our community. So that's one good thing. So um, with our merge, we also were able to now invest in our staff members because we said that's where the positive mentorship happens. You know, so investing in, you know, the people that are in your community already. How do we hire them? You know, so how do we how can we afford to hire them um, is, is a big one for us. So not only how do we get jobs for people, but how do we hire certain positive role models? Um, because, again. While it's great to rely on volunteers, you can't rely on volunteers, you know, as, as you know, as much because they spread themselves thin. Um, while it's great to rely on grants, you know, for those one or two years, it, what happens year three um, when, when you're starting to, to, you know, work for some momentum and, and, and build. So as far as our um, agency this past year for the 2020 year, a lot of it was federal money only because we did um, our food program. So by us serving so much food in the community through um, summer food service and through CACFP and, and you know, reaching the families, our, our numbers will look different on our 990s than they have in the past because we've had, we, we had a larger federal funding than we ever had um, because our food service went from you know, 100,000 meals to over 500,000 meals last year. So um, while it was great for the community, it does put us in a different bracket for our audit and all that stuff moving forward. But again, um, you know, we, we do, we do rely on donations. Um, you know, while people think we do events, our events don't really make the money. It's more just to tell the stories. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Patrick? Council president. Hi, Patrick. How are you? Good. Patrick, good. Um, I've been down to the Boys and Girls Club on Friday nights, and I was pretty shocked, Patrick, of all um, the youth that were down there, not just playing basketball, but a lot of folks on the bleachers, things to that nature. Um, Team Hero, obviously, doing an awesome job down there, and your programs are just fabulous. Um, Outside of money, what can we do um, in terms of trying to provide maybe on Friday nights more activities um, for that age group that does have nowhere to go, especially in the winter, um, you know, they're, um, you know, bounded at home, they want to play basketball, they want to play dodgeball, things to that nature. What about opening up? the Boys and Girls Club, and what would you mean to, you know, do programs, say, on Friday nights and, you know, the weekends where, you know, they tend to not have a whole lot to do? Yeah, so uh, again, um, just our regulations just mandate that we have one staff member. So um, that doesn't, you know, that's not a huge lift on our end. One staff member doesn't cost a whole lot. So it'd be volunteers after that. It'd be committed volunteers. Um, and it's something that we could do and we could set up to have those committed volunteers. But again, if we have 150 kids and volunteers don't show up, that one staff member is overwhelmed. So again, it's just making sure that we have the consistency of the programming. Um, 
you know, as the community comes together, you know, so basically our, our club has kind of been used as like a non-for-profit hub. And that's what I like about our organization and our, our clubhouse specifically is, you know, if, if someone has an idea concept, as long as they tie it to the boys and girls club and our mission, uh, we can umbrella it. So it's not, you know, it's not like, Hey, you don't have to go get your own insurance because it could be covered under us. Um, the only problem we has we have as an organization is if somebody does that, but then they want their own message to come across again, because we have to follow all of our, Boys and Girls Club regulations. Um, so, so I think that's what we do a great job with is the partnerships, the utilization of our building. Um, so the one, one problem we have is we get rental income on weekends sometimes. And while, you know, and, and most of them are Troy teams that rent it, but it, and we keep it, you know, basically lower, but then that rent goes right back into our programs. Um, so one fortunate thing for COVID is we actually have, you know, um, you know, a couple swim teams, you know, we have a Troy swim team, but we also have a Latham swim team that comes in because that was something that the governor allowed was swimming. So we were able to do that, generate some money. And our, our heater just broke of our pool, which was $15,000, which normally we would, you know, have to appeal over, but because we were renting it out since COVID started, we had the money in reserve. So it was, it was an easy fix for us that we were fortunate uh, cause uh, otherwise $15,000, if you had the same conversation two years ago, I would say, Hey, we might have to close the pool down. So, um, you know, actually today the, the heater got put right back in. Um, and again, and then it's not an appeal out to the community to help us. It's, you know, hey, we, we, we found a system to help ourselves and help our community. Um, so I think as far as the weekends and the Friday night, it would probably just, you know, it only cost us as an organization just to have one staff member there to make sure everything goes. As far as, far as rules and regulations and ratios, um, at that point they're dropping. But it's, again, it's, um, you know, I would hate to say, hey, we do it. And then we have three volunteers show up for one day and there's 150 teens. You know, it just gotcha. wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be fair for those three volunteers or the one staff member. But yeah, as a community, I think, you know, if we had a, a great system in place, it would be an easy lift. Um, so stuff like movie nights are a little bit easier, which I know we're going to have some more of those over the summer. Um, right. uh, because, you know, we can actually do those right outside if we want to, you know, in our parking mm -hmm. lot. Um, and stuff like that. And then one of our programs we just um, launched that will be coming over to Troy is Lyrison 101, which is an RV with a DJ equipment, which we will then be able to put through the city of Troy as well. So we piloted it in Albany last year um, at, at the end of last year. Um, but that's something that we're going to have in, in this in the, as a staple in the city as well. So we'll pick out parks to go to. We'll advertise that we'll go to those parks. We'll, of course, let Monica know first so everyone knows and we have the proper permits and then we'll set up shop and, and do some events um, over the summertime. Awesome. Thank you, Patrick. You guys seriously do a phenomenal job. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. Hi, Patrick. I, I don't think anybody here disputes the quality of your programs. We're all grateful for uh, the number of kids that you can serve. I'm kind of more interested in the kids that you can't serve. Um, I know there are kids that, that uh, uh, can't participate in Boys and Girls Club programs because of behavioral issues. Um, what do we need? And they're the ones who are probably more likely to brush up against uh, the police department or the criminal justice system. Is there, do you have a sense of, you know, how big that population is? And do you have a sense of what's needed for those kids? Yeah, so um, I think for that population, um, you know, we're here for the kids who need us the most. Um, sometimes we do have to make tough choices. So there are some kids that unfortunately, you know, for the safety of some of our kids, you know, for instance, in the past, you know, we've had um, members of gangs bring in guns into our facility. At that point, you know, we have to ask the kids who's bringing the guns to either a stop and, you know, you know, as the nicest, nicest possible way um, or, or B, you know, um, you know, they can't come to our program. Uh, one thing we were looking to launch this year and partner with um, several entities and using some OJP funding would be to have a mentoring program during the day. So in a typical year when school's in session, you know, our building sits there stagnant. So how can we have, how can we work with, um, of course, the school districts or, you know, or the police department to have something there? So even if it's, you know, hey, uh, we have a police, uh, we, we work well actually with the probation department as well over the past two years, kind of, you know, uh, with, with referrals of, of kids. Uh, but, but again, with that, um, you know, sometimes, you know, if it's, 
those teens that, or teens or young adults that need more of the one-on-one -on -one mentoring, it does, it does come into a fact of our OCFS license, our ratios. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of tape we have to, you know, jump through for that. Um, but yeah, again, I think utilizing our building it, during the day, um, one thing we, we've actually uh, started to think about this year is more of a case manager position at our organization. So it would be somebody that could even go into the schools, um, you know, and, and it's somebody they know. So, you know, we hire somebody from the community that they know that can kind of go into schools um, and be their advocate as well, because a lot of these teens, you know, they just might not have the right advocate for them. So, you know, whether borderline, they're either going to go down one path or the other. And it's, you know, how do we pull them back to, to you know, our. So I think those are some things that we are we are looking to work on and actually create funding for. There are other questions for Patrick. I just have uh, one more question. What are the hours of the Boys and Girls Club? Um, currently, it's 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, because we do virtual learning in the morning. Um, typical school year, it's 2 o'clock to about 8, 8.30. And then summertime, we open up as early as 7.30 until 8.30 at night. Wow. Um, sometimes we still open a little later, depending. But again, with curfews, we want the kids home, you know, um, you know where they should be or, you know, um, just to help them stay out of trouble as well. Um, because we, you know, again, it's transportation. So if someone comes to our, our thing on a Friday night and we're letting them out nine, nine 30, 10 o'clock, how are they getting home? You know, um, how's that journey going to look for them? So we try, we try to end everything eight, eight 30. And we even stopped doing like rentals. We used to do rentals and birthday parties, but again, it's just more for, um, the safety of, of the kids and, and, and our community and, you know, the organization is, you know, we try to have everyone, you know, nine o'clock ish, you know. Um, unless, you know, unless, like I said, but by, by we had, we do have a bus behind the club. It's something we are looking, you know, we have a lot of things we're looking to work towards, but again, it's, it all comes down to, you know, funding, you know, and, um, while the minimum wage increase is, is great, it also, you know, it, it, you know, as, as everyone goes up, we want to pay our staff more as well. So, you know, as minimum wage goes up, our, our middle managers, you know, are, are feeling the pressure. So how do we as organization pay them more? So sometimes we have to put something on our back burner of ideas or concepts, so. Patrick, who do you co coordinate or collaborate with on the workforce development? Our workforce program? development now is, is gonna be Rensselaer County. Um, so Brian Williams and his team would be, so we, uh, we just got awarded a grant um, effective two weeks ago to run a program from now until the end of September. Uh, before it was the city of Albany and they covered the cost for Rensselaer County as well as Albany. Um, but our Rensselaer County numbers were, were extremely way better um, from, from an organizational standpoint um, than in Albany, um, which is, which is a, a, a testament to the, the Troy branch, but also something that we know we need to work on now in Albany and, you know, and building those community relationships and partnerships. So right now it's the Rensselaer County uh, funding it. Um, and we've had some, um, some um, charities as well. And we have a great team director. I don't know if Starlita Smith's on, but she can make sure she tells her husband that Roy Smith is the, the best team director to have, which allows us a, a lot of lot of comfort as an organization. Mayor. One last question, I promise. Um, from time to time, uh, when violence spikes in the city, shootings in particular, it's as a result not always, but sometimes it's as a result of tension between people in Albany and people in Troy. And so there's retaliation and shootings. Um, now that you cover both cities, are you looking at any programs that um, bring kids from those two communities together at a younger age? So as they age, um, you know, they know each other and they're less likely to become violent toward each other. Yes. Yeah, so uh, two years before our merge, actually, we started working on um, a basketball league. So we just do basketball leagues between our two clubs. Um, but I think that's what the Lyricism 101 band is going to be, is mobile unit is going to be able to do. Um, it's, you know, the kids want to tell a story. And when they realize that the story is the same in Albany, it's the same in Troy, uh, getting them together and, the, you know, the same thing and collaborating is one of one of the, the things that we are going to be looking forward to do to doing, um, you know, uh, we have, so we have right now in Albany is where they have actually a recording studio uh, is in the building. So we have four Troy kids that actually go over there right now and participate in the program. 
Uh, now, now we have a smaller one in Troy that we just added um, a few months ago. Um, so now we're looking to build that up. But again, we have to find the right staff members for that because it's it's a, it's a unique thing to have. It's to be great with kids, but also great with music, and you know, and the DJing and or the recording aspect of it. So um, we have a couple of volunteers who have been great in building up the program in the Troy side as well. But that's one of one of the um, you know the programs we are looking looking towards. Uh, workforce was one, so our workforce was headquartered in Troy, and we we uh, van the kids over from Albany if they are participating. Um, so it was just, you know, the same thing, you know, we have, we'd have the Albany, um, kids over here in Troy and there was, uh, seven kids from Albany. Um, and there was uh, 31 ish, 32 ish from Troy in that program. But yeah, that's, that's, that was, that's been one of our main concepts since the merge is how do we actually, you know, stop that tension, um, moving forward. Councilman Zalewski. Thanks, Tamara. Uh, Patrick, you just mentioned a recording studios. That was something that I didn't realize that uh, the Boys and Girls Club was involved in. Are you looking for uh, music gear, music equipment? Uh, we always say we could find a home for everything. So our, our thing is, yes, we try to look for homes for everything. Um, so, yeah, so in Troy, we do have, uh, through one of the grants we have, um, six uh, breakaway session um, DJing equipment, you know, that they can hook up the laptops. And then, um, uh, you know, we were fortunate to receive a CDBG grant where we actually did uh, purchase uh, equipment like laptops and um, iPads for them to use for not only for schoolwork, but for other programs as well. Uh, but yeah, we're always looking, we always take donations, um, donation of time and, you know, and goods. I, just, I never knew that. So that's really interesting. And I, I, I will talk to you later. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to waste time in this. Yeah. Meeting. And, and we'll, we'll set up tours as well. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know, we actually have our own uh, freight farm behind, we have a farm behind our, our, our club. So if you drive by and you wonder what that big box is behind, it's actually a farm that grows lettuce that our teens manage. So um, before COVID, it was, you know, it was a, a great program. The kids were selling it to local restaurants um, and then utilizing the funds for their own projects throughout the city. So. Uh, follow up question. Uh, Obviously, our, our affinity groups, by definition, um, are they participate to provide recommendations on reimagining uh, policing. Uh, and it seems to me that the Boys and Girls Club has positive interactions uh, with the Troy Police and other you know police departments. Uh, is there anywhere where you feel that that relationship could be improved? It's kind of, and I'm piggybacking on uh, the deputy mayor's question, but is there anything that you think is missing? Or if you wanted to pretend that you were Chief Owens right now and could direct police, what would you do? If I was Chief Owens, I, I would look for funding for um, for a PAL. You know, um, I, I think, you know, just looking across the country and being at Boys and Girls Clubs, things, it's just more building that relationship. But again, it, it costs money to do. So I think, you know, um, Having a PAL coordinator, I think, would, you know, would be great for the city um, if it's something that they could afford um, just to implement. And we're right across the street. You know, our, our facility is there for the use, you know, so it, I think that would that would bridge a gap between um, our youth and, and the police department, you know, to even um, in Albany. At one point, we had a um, we had a police officer's office was at the Albany location uh, and Troy right now. It's right across the street. It's really easy. But before they had a, an office. And he'd just go around and shoot basketballs while he was waiting for a call, you know, stuff like that, I think is just more of a, you know, for the, the kids to actually see like this person is part of our community. They're human. They're part of our community. Um, you know, they care about me is, at the end of the day. Absolutely. I mean, my feeling is if you start young and build uh, positive relationships between uh, the youth and, uh, and law enforcement, that can only improve relationships as, as everyone, as the kids get older. So, uh, yeah, I definitely think this, this is, this is definitely something we should focus on. Deputy Mayor. So one of the, one of the things that we've heard is the void of services in North Central. And I know you're not, you know, you're not, that's not foreign to you. You've heard this conversation mm -hmm. and there's always been a request for a community center in the North Central neighborhood that would serve the needs of the, of those youth. How do you think that that can be addressed? And, um, you know, a lot of the challenges that, uh, you know, in, we all know the realities of funding. Um, 
you know, is that something that you've taken a look at? Is it something that you could perhaps look at expanding? What is the disconnect between the community that's there and the Boys and Girls Club? I don't know if it's a, if it's a mental thing. I don't know if it's a physical thing or transportation thing. What are some of the obstacles as why we're having a hard time connecting you two? Um, I, I think some of it's transportation. Um, it's right in the middle of two different Boys and Girls Clubs. Um, is another thing. So, you know, we have two boys and girls clubs in our city, which, which is, you know, is common, you know, at, at boys and girls clubs. Um, but I know that's where a lot of, uh, you know, the, the direction of the mergers and stuff are happening in boys and girls of America is to strengthen our program quality. Um, as far as it's something we could help with, of, of course we could, um, we could help with, you know, uh, that's kind of why we started thinking of the pop-up program um, uh, techniques or methods um, is to bring the RV or bring some equipment to parks and, you know, and, and do some programming because it helps us out with recruitment. It helps us, helps the community out, helps the families out. Um, and that's kind of why we, uh, you know, started working with even Troy Housing um, and then Albany Side Albany Housing to actually expand our reach uh, through the housings. Um, so, you know, last summer, uh, uh, Troy Housing was, was fantastic. We partnered with them and now we opened up at Grishel Heights. And then it's, you know, maybe what's the next step um, because again, it is, it's overhead, you know, it, it's staffing and you know why, why, why that sounds like it's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's a lot of money, but it's, Hey, it's what we pay our staff members. You know, this is, you know, whatever we pay our staff who live there, that's, that's what we need to raise, I guess. Um, so something like that, it's, it's just gonna be the overhead component, you know, uh, you know, exploring, you know, Hey, is it great to build a huge facility in North central Troy Would that, you know, would that help out, you know, the whole community community a whole and you know but again you know capital campaign that's you know schenectady just did one with a boys girls club it's 12 million dollars um to build you know a building and then it's hey do you retrofit another building in there and then it's like okay but what happens if the roof claps who's responsible you know so it, it, it's that's that's the whole thing um us as a boys and girls club our our building is there it's 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 paid for its own for but it doesn't mean that you know down the road if another opportunity comes where you know hey we could do this we could do that we could partner with this and there's a new building there, then, you know, it's definitely something we could move our whole operations over, which will help out because if we're paying X amount already to have a building for gas and lights for staffing, you know, to, to move, because, you know, again, we are, we are located downtown Troy now, you know, um, when, when that was built, it was around all apartment complexes. So the kids would be able to walk over. Um, so, you know, I think that's the thing. It's just transportation, you know, um, I know, I know everyone always says that the, the bridge there is, you know, the barrier. So yeah. it could be that as well. You know, how do we get them across there? So do you know which neighborhoods you typically pull your kids from? Um, I can give you the exact data. Um, it's kind of all over because it depends on what school. So we do have, we have, we have definitely have North Central is probably one of our, you know, uh, bigger populations for our teens. They actually walk down. So a transportation would make it easier. I'm sure more kids would come as well. Um, but again, that, a lot of that transportation, you know, we're even thinking like, how do we as boys and girls club afford bus passes moving forward? You know, because again, with COVID, um, you know, how do we get people to transport to new, new spots if we're able to open up something? Um, so I think, um, I think, yeah, I think transportation, um, is, is, is probably the number one thing. Um, but right now our after school program, every school transports to us. So before COVID we'd have 60, 70 after school kids, and then we'd have 70 teens, you know, and they walk. So, so all together, you know, half, and, and they, they were majority you know, a little bit more North central, um, some South Troy, um, believe it or not over, uh, the past few months, it's actually been some Lansenburg too, with the virtual, because we opened up for virtual learning as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, because again, we're not around neighborhoods, so it's definitely a mix of South Troy and then you know some a mix of North Troy right now, and some East Side, and um, so we have it's 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 actually it's so weird because I say you know like there's not many families on the same block coming to the Boys and Girls Club, and why not? You know how how come you know how can you have that person be the advocate to say, hey, my child's having an amazing time there, you know, and there's a free program, you know, how come you know how come there's not more um, with with COVID though, we did limit. So we actually, you know, unfortunately, you know, we just limited numbers just because of the safety. So we're, we, we are kind of almost at max capacity. We only try to keep 30 kids in the building at times. So we have 30 virtual and then 30 new kids can come in for after school uh, with a mixture of a couple because you have to keep the pods and, and all that. So, 
Um, but a typical year, yes, yeah, it is spread out. But yeah, again, I think, um, you know, there, there are, there's room there at the club for us to expand more programs and more services as, as well. Well, Patrick, I, on behalf of the committee, we'd like to thank you for coming this evening and sharing your perspective and having a chance to dialogue with us. And thank you for all the work you're doing. Well, thank you. Okay. All right. Have so a great night. Gonna, yes. So we're going to go to our, our second speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Abitabile, uh, the Lansingburg superintendent, uh, and I will turn it over to you. Uh, make sure I'm unmuted here. So thanks for, for uh, having me. The mayor, re by the way, it was a very close attempt at my last name. So that, that wasn't bad. Uh, yeah. Abitabile. Thank you for that. That was very uh, great. <laughs> literally every day of my life. Um, but uh, I wanted to thank the mayor for the, for the invite. Um, my understanding is uh, there may be some questions for me regarding uh, the SROs in our, in our school district, um, SRO in our, in our school district. So I was just here to speak on behalf of the Troy police department on behalf of school resource officers, but I think probably more on behalf of the school resource officer that we have in, in uh, Jeff Streeter, who just does an absolutely incredible job. Um, this is my first SRO in Lansingburg because I'm still relatively new, but I've had several SROs in my prior life as, as an administrator in a very similar dist district. Uh, I've seen some good SROs. I've had some great experience with some SROs and I've had some poor experiences with some SROs. Um, Jeff's is about as good as they get. Um, we're, we're really happy with the job that he does. Uh, we see it every day with the relationships that he builds with the students. Um, he's not, you know, he, he's really, he, he's not thought of as just a cop. I mean, he really is like a social worker. He's like a counselor. He, he counsels the students when they need to, he reaches out to them. He knows our students. He's on the streets. He's knocking on doors. Um, he just does an absolutely incredible job of diffusing situations on a, on a near daily basis. So um, I know that uh, there has been lots of chatter out there about removing uh, police officers from, from schools. Uh, I hope that's not the case in, in the city of Troy. I don't want to speak on behalf of Superintendent Carmelo, but uh, I know that we are thrilled with the job that SRO Streeter does in, in Lansingburg. Uh, I would hate to lose him. Um, I, like I said, I, I know that there's some there's some chatter out there in the political world about, you know, not having cops in schools. And I think that a lot of that has to do with, they just don't have the right person and we have the right person. So, you know, anything that I need to do to advocate on behalf of continuing uh, to have an SRO in our school, I, I would like, I would be devastated if we didn't have Streeter in our, in our buildings, working with our students and our staff every day. Thank you for that uh, perspective. Does the committee have, have questions? Okay. DA Donnelly. Hi there, sorry about that. I forgot to unmute myself. Um, you, you actually said exactly what I was gonna say. We've heard a couple of times over the last few weeks about we need to get cops out of our schools. Um, I have five children in a, a uh, suburban school district and we have a, a member of the sheriff's department at the middle school, we have a member of the East Greenwich Police at the high school, and it seems to work out well, but I don't have a lot of familiarity with how it works in, an, in a more urban environment like the, the Lansingburg School District. So what I'm hearing you say, and it makes sense to me, is we love having them there. So I would like to understand what they're doing for the kids that, that make them such a value. And, and I, you know, I mean, my perspective is I, I assume it's a good thing. I think I just want to hear it so that we can understand the benefits because we've heard so many people say that it's it's um, something, you know, in this particular capacity, we've heard people say, let's get them out of school. So I'd like to understand not only how are they helpful to staff and to the whole administration because they're diffusing and they're doing all those things that we want them to, but tell us a little bit about the positive impact on the kids. I mean, I, I think the overarching theme for the work that he does is that he genuinely cares about our, our children. Um, he's extremely approachable. He, you know, there's, there's, He's not, I, I think maybe there may be some misconceptions about having a police officer in a, in a school building that they're there strictly has a deterrent. And I just, 
I don't believe that we have students in this district who are thinking of doing something, some act, and are saying, well, I better not do that because Officer Streeter is in this building somewhere. That's really not what this is about. This is about having a, a positive role model in our district who happens to be a police officer. But it really, like, it's not, it's really not about being a police officer. It's just him being a, a positive role model, a positive influence on the children that they see as somebody who was also out in the streets, you know, doing some work. And like I said, he does a ton of home visits. And, uh, you know, we, we just had our new logo put on his car. And we did that for a, a reason, because when he pulls up, they know it's not a Troy Police Department, you know, officer coming, it's Officer Streeter, like they know him, they're familiar with him. And the reason that they're familiar with him is because he takes the time to get to know the children. So he's not, you know, a cop. I know I don't like, I don't like to use that term cops, but, but that's, they don't, they don't look at him like that. He's, he's, he's a friend, he's an ally and they know that he, he cares. And I, you know, I don't know how rare that is. Like I said, I've had positive and negative experiences with various SROs throughout my career um, for, for different reasons, but he's, he's top notch. This is a, this is a perfect job for him. It fits right in his skill set. He's got a great temperament. He's got a great personality. Uh, and he just like, he gets kids and he, and he knows how to work with them. And right now he was, well, up until this week, he was primarily stationed at Turnpike with our youngest children. It's, you know, you probably think SRO, you're thinking more high school and that is where he would normally spend, well, starting next week, he'll probably be spending a little bit more of his time there, but he really does run the, run the gamut, you know, and he works with the five-year-olds and the six-year-olds just as much as he works with the 17 and 18 year olds. And that's just, it's it, his skill set is, is really rare. So I find him to be just incredibly valuable. It has, does, I've, I've spoken to my administrative staff about this in advance of this meeting and they are a hundred percent in agreement with everything that I'm saying, mostly because they've been in the district longer than me. So um, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's part of the culture in Lansingburg and we'd hate to lose him. Hate to lose him. Let's go to Kevin and then to council president. Superintendent, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your, your comments. Um, and it sounds like you've got a great marriage uh, with this uh, particular individual. Uh, you've also shared that, you know, you, you, you've had experiences professionally where, where it wasn't so great. So, um, in those cases, uh, what power uh, or influence does the, the superintendent or the school or the community have uh, about, say, if, if, if they believe uh, an officer is not working out well? How does, that, how does that assignment happen and how does that assignment get, get altered if it's not working out? It's not a good marriage. So I, I can tell you. Uh, my, in my prior experience, that was a big issue. And what was happening in my, my previous life before Lansingburg is the police department was picking who the SRO was going to be. And almost every time we had a bad experience, it was because the police officer was being assigned there involuntarily. They didn't, they didn't want to be an SRO. They didn't really want to work with the kids. You know, typically there was something that had happened and they put them in the, in the schools against their will. And, and so, um, there was a time in my prior life that we, we actually uh, disbanded the partnership with the police department because we said, we're all for having an SRO, but if we don't have a hand in determining who that person is, they're, they're, they're an employee of the school. And the agreement that we have with the city of Troy, I believe is it's a 50, 50, I think we each pay half of his salary. So, uh, you know, we've always felt like, you know, if we're contributing funds towards the expense of having an SRO. We should have a say in who it is. Um, officer Streeter in, in this case, I don't know how that happened because he was here before me, but, um, I feel like if there was an issue regarding his, his performance or his behavior on the job, uh, I feel between chief Owens and I, we have a pretty good relationship. I think he's on this call. Um, I think because he is still a city employee, but he's really, I still consider him, you know, part of our team as well. I think it's gonna have to be something that we would have to come together and, and work jointly to solve whatever this issue seem to be but um I, I have to tell you i think that would that that's a long shot for that ever happening at least with who we have currently thank you council president thank you um 
thank you, Tiny. And um, as you may know, I um, am a huge proponent of SROs in our school, but um, Kevin actually took my question. I was curious why, um, you know, maybe some didn't work out and you certainly explained that and how you went about um, amending it to make it work. I guess, um, you know, for the public's benefit, maybe um, there is, you know, kind of this vision or maybe even a stereotype that SROs are militaristic and, you know, more metal detector type of uh, police officers. And I've seen that firsthand that it's not that way. Can you give just for the public and maybe even the task force, um, the working group here for folks who aren't aware, give a typical day of an SRO, please. And obviously you can condense it. Thank you. And thanks again, Tiny. No, no problem. Tinny, by the way, but that's okay too. Tiny. Mis- I'm so sorry. Mis- that's all right. Oh people mispronounce <laughs> that too. That's no big deal. I guess that- you should try with the superintendent. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Tini. So, so I think that his a typical day for him is um, we we use him for arrival and dismissal. So he he starts his day and ends his day outside in the in the parking lots, and that includes trying to be at all three campuses. The middle school and the high school are kind of together. So um, his mornings and afternoons are super busy. Um, the way that he spends the rest of his day is kind of a little bit in the buildings, a little bit out of the buildings. Um, we've been, um, huge proponents of home visits before COVID, but because of COVID, we've been doing much more home visits. So there are certain times that, um, we like to, you know, I mean, unfortunately we, you know, we have some staff members who may be a little nervous to, you know, stop by someone's home and he will be there to support them. There's other times that, you know, unfortunately, there is some police work that he has to do. Uh, You may have heard that one of our campuses had a little burglary and some vandalism over the weekend, and he had to drop everything to deal with that, which he's done an incredible job, as the rest of the police department has done. And my understanding is that's moving forward. Um, I think that there's, you know, not that there's a ton of violence in our schools, but he is still there in case there ever is. Um, typically, uh, SROs are incredibly helpful if there's ever any type of um, drugs or alcohol or any substance that's being brought into the school. I'm just my prior life as a principal. That was my first phone call. You know, if, if we think we have somebody who's under the influence or something or somebody who is in possession of something to have a, a school resource officer on campus compared to me having to pick up the phone and call the police department to send the closest patrolman over to come in and help with this investigation. You know, he, he's a somebody in the school. Everybody knows who he is. He's a familiar face. And so sometimes those SROs are able to, because of that relationship, they're able to get the students to work a little bit better with the school officials to, to do what we need to, to do. But that just speaks to his relationship. So, I mean, it's a little bit of everything. And I think that he sort of has it's kind of like an administrator where you you have your day mapped out on how you think it's going to run from 7 to 3.30 every day. But with that, you also need to be prepared to drop everything when something happens and be there on the spot. And it's I'm sure that's what a police officer's life is like anyway. And it's probably what some of your lives are probably like anyway. Um, but that's, you know, that's a skill that's really important to to have. And he you know, like I said, he has it and he has the temperament and the, and the mentality to, to, to do it well. Thank you, Tini. And just real quick, maybe, um, and I apologize, Tamara, but also maybe talk about the relationship between the school and the community. I know you're here just to talk SRO maybe, but um, maybe quickly you could talk about the relationship and how obviously that morphs into um, keeping our streets and neighborhoods safer. Well, I, I, to, to start with, again, as someone being relatively new to, to this community, um, first of all, I think, I, I think I told mayor madness when I met him, I think it was a year ago when I, when I first met you, um, I never realized that when I took the job that there wasn't a town of Lansingburg or a hamlet of Lansingburg or a village of Lansingburg. I, I thought there was a mayor of Lansingburg. I thought there was the police chief of Lansingburg, the Lansingburg fire department. And I just didn't, I didn't realize that. So when I first 
you know, went out to, to breakfast with our board president, uh, Jason Shover, I said, you know, am I going to meet these people? And, and he says, no, 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 this is part of, of Troy. Like you're on the northern like third of Troy. And it just kind of blew my mind because I, I never, you know, I never really thought about it ahead of time. And I, and I had to figure that out. And so I say all of that because be, I feel because of, of that, there is that identity in Lansingburg and it's a very proud history. And, you know, there are the, the Lansingburg people want to still have that identity of being Lansingburg. They don't want to be called North Troy or North central. They, they want to be Lansingburg and, and, uh, and the school is the central point of all of that. And they're very, and I think that's why we have the community support in the school district that we have. And what I've seen is it's not just the, the parents of the students that, that care about the school district, the community cares. I've never really seen anything like this where the communities and the local business leaders, like they're involved, they know these, these kids. And when they see them out in the streets, I feel like they will say something to them if they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. But it's, it, there's a huge community support uh, that, that we see with the students. And of course that naturally rolls right into the school, but I feel like that has to do with just this pride factor that they have of being this sort of subsection of the of the overall city. Thanks, Tini. I, I am a Burke alumni for the record. <laughs> Thank you. Chief Owens. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abitabel. Uh, from your first days of arriving in Lansenburg, you made it a point to reach out to the police department. We appreciate your partnership. Um, I really appreciate your public recognition of Patrolman Jeff Streeter. We agree he does a phenomenal job and it is a good fit for the department. Um, as a parent of a student in the district, I'd also like to thank you for your work trying to get through COVID and keep the kids learning and engaged. And that's been a challenge at every level. So you've done a, a great job with that. If I could kind of answer to Kevin's point about how the assignments happen, uh, typically within the police department, all assignments were generally by seniority. Um, that's through the contract and because of the work and I think the trust and respect with the union leadership, we were able to get the union to agree for SRO assignments that the school districts would absolutely have a say in who gets selected. So what we did is we allowed uh, members to bid by seniority. We took that list of uh, candidates for the position and then we met with each superintendent of each school district. And we went through and we talked about uh, the work history. A lot of times the superintendents at the time in Lansenburg and the superintendent Troy, uh, they were familiar with some of the officers through, uh, you know, working at different events, games, things at the schools that they were aware of who they were. So, like I said, typically assignments would be straight seniority, but because we were able to come to an agreement, SROs are selected based on the department as well as the school district. Thank you, Chief. Are there any other any other questions? This time? Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for being here this evening uh, for these affinity group presentations that have been focused on youth. Uh, it was very helpful to have your perspective and have a chance for the committee to ask questions. Um, so thank you for being here with us. No problem. It's been uh, it's been a very exciting week, and it'll be even more exciting next week because we're finally getting all these kids back in school. So uh, it's it's been a good week. And with that, I'm going to hop off because I've actually got to get my kids to to bed myself. So uh, thank you guys very much for having me. If there's anything else you need, most of you already have my email address. Some of you have my cell number. Reach out anytime. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. So at this point in time, we will go into um, our committee debrief time. Thank you, Patrick, for being with us. Thank you, have a great one. Okay, so I think what we'd like to do is, you know, what we've done in the past, which is just to, you know, discuss reflections on those two presentations, things that stood out to the committee. Councilman Zalewski. Yeah, I just, I'll make a brief opening comment. Uh, first of all, I think uh, both uh, the Boys and Girls Club and uh, 
uh, you know, Lansingburg School District. These these are examples of, uh, as far as I can tell, very positive interactions uh, with the police department. Uh, obviously, funding is always an issue, uh, especially with the Boys and Girls Club. And uh, of course, that will always that's always the case that uh, you know you need money for programs. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not like I'm not really um, I'm not pulling out of this any uh, recommendations for uh, you know ch change within the department here with regards to uh, these interactions. I mean, you know, this Officer Streeter is getting rave reviews. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, there's two things we have to look at, you know, some, some of our affinity groups are telling us that uh, SROs are not a positive thing for schools. And another affinity group is telling us that uh, they are. Um, I'm just telling you from my own perspective. And I remember uh, the rave reviews that Mark Millington uh, received uh, in uh, Troy High School. Um, you know, he was just really respected. And again, it, it takes a certain type of officer to pull that off. Right, you've got to be able to interact with uh, kids in a in a certain way. Um, but it, it appears that whoever is making these decisions to get um, to pick these particular officers in the schools, they're doing a good job. And these interactions, uh, as far as I can tell, are positive. So I would say that this is a you know this is a positive takeaway uh, for youth and police interaction. Um, and you know my my own personal perspective on it is that I would not want to see, uh, I wouldn't want to eliminate any, any SRO program. I, I program, I think it needs to, I think it would, it should continue, uh, especially given the, the feedback we're getting. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Yeah, hi, I just wanted to add that, because um, there's nobody to speak for uh, the other two SROs in the Troy School District, but, but I am aware that they are very well uh, thought of there as well. Um, Officer Don Marble and Officer C.J. Rockwell. So Don Marble's in the high school, C.J.'s in the middle school, and uh, Don has been there quite a bit longer than than C.J., but he's pretty much a fixture, just like uh, just like Jeff Streeter is, and the kids, you know, flock to him basically. I mean, he is he's like he's like the mayor of the high school, so he does a phenomenal job as well. And I know that the superintendent is very happy with both of those officers as well. Uh, so I just wanted to to add that. Um, with the Troy Boys Club, I think that I, I know we had looked at a pal in the past and uh, it's it's not it's not a very easy thing to do. There's, a, there's like some legalities involved and, and so on. But in the in the interim, I certainly would love to look at it again. In the interim, I'd like to see some some more volunteer opportunities for our officers. Um, so maybe we'll get together with Patrick and see if he has a list of some volunteer time that maybe we could we could show our officers, because there are a lot of younger officers that, that would like to, to help out with the kids and be with the kids. And I think that some of it is just a lack of communication and not knowing what those opportunities are. So um, so we'll get with Patrick and, and maybe we can at least start there. Uh, you know, aside from doing the PAL, at least we can get, get some more uh, officers involved with the kids uh, in, in that organization. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Do we have maybe go one more comment and okay, maybe two more and then we'll go over to Chief Owens for the presentation. So uh, Deputy Mayor and then Chris. So I just wanted to clarify a couple of points and not in bad way, just more adding on to the, to the, to the clarity of this. So um, just so people realize when we had those 11,000 people in our city over the summer, the two gentlemen on those bikes that were the most prominently probably photographed were Streeter and Marble. Um, they were our SROs and they actually approached the department and the leadership of the department and thought that approaching it in that direction was a, was a, was a good way to be able to work with that crowd that they were expecting. So while they're doing really good things at schools, they're also doing really good things in the community and have connectivity to that. And so we just need to make sure that we remember that as well too. I know that there's been some conversation with some of the affinity groups in regards to funding with um, that the city supplies. I know that there's a lot of accusations that the city does not supply funding for youth programming in the city. Um, I actually shared with the council president and uh, a couple other affinity group members, some of the, the amounts of money that have been um, have been uh, slowly increased over the years, over the past 10 years. 
but we do do we do fund some youth sports, uh, some youth programming. We do uh, after school programming at the two boys and girls club and the CYO. We also do uh, we hire the boys and girls club to staff the pool for us during the summers. Um, and then also what we do is when we closed the pools back in, in back in 2017, we actually started funding summer camp programs. These summer camp programs were open. We had three different ones, the YMCA, the Troy Boys and Girls Club, and the Lansingburg Boys and Girls Club all ran them. And it was up to 50 kids. And it was completely free for six weeks during the summer. We had the hardest time getting people to go to those places. It was incredible. And we put information out. We tried to get it out through all of the, uh, all the um, pastors that we had. So I just want people to understand that we do have funding and we just ex actually expanded the, the personnel for that too. And there's always ways for us to look to expand that um, in the future. So I just want to make sure we have some clarity around that too. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to um, talk about, as we have with some of the other presentations, the common theme that I saw with the two presentations, um, which I think overlaps with what we heard um, in many of the affinity groups, was that what works is um, building relationships and building trust. Um, you know, I heard a lot about care about the kids, they get to know them, um, that kind of thing. From this perspective tonight, uh, both groups that spoke or both uh, people that spoke talked about that being uh, being done very well and working. Um, and it's kind of the theme that I think many of the affinity groups were hoping for, um, you know, getting to know people more, building relationships and building trust. Thank you for that. Um, does anyone have anything else that they really want to share now before we or is it okay to turn it over to Chief Bowens? Okay. All right, Chief, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Tamara. Thank you to those on the meeting and the committee members for the opportunity to try to share a little bit more insight into the Troy Police Department. I don't know that I can fully describe who we are, all that we do and how we fit into the entire Troy community in a short amount of time, uh, but we'll certainly try to give it a try. Uh, and then we'll answer any questions that might come up just from this, and then certainly other questions as we go through the entire process. Uh, John, if you're able to display um, the slideshow. Thank you. If you can move to the next slide. Might be a little hard to read on people's screens, hopefully not. This, the, uh, the presentation will be available, obviously, online, and, and we can review it further. Uh, but this is the organization organizational chart for the police department. Uh, I think uh, early on, Stacy had asked for it, or maybe others. And so, uh, this is just a high-level overview of the assignments and the units within the police department. Um, you can see uh, who reports through each side. So, as you know, Deputy Chief, he's our detective of the sport division and our operations division, Assistant Chief Chris Keene, and you'll hear from both of them uh, as we go through the presentation. We'll go on to the next slide, thank you. Um, this is the breakdown, again, this was asked for by members of the committee. This is our race, ethnicity, and gender breakdown. And so I know uh, we've talked about uh, recent hiring. We hired a total of seven new members in the past week or two. Uh, they began the academy um, two days ago, I believe, yeah, on the 22nd. And so again, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little further as we go through, but uh, the importance of having a more diverse um, police department and the staffing, part of that goes to our recruitment efforts and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but that's just a breakdown uh, for everyone to see. At this time, I'd like to ask Assistant Chief Chris Keene, our Operations Chief, uh, to continue with the presentation. Hello, uh, my name is Christopher Keene. I'm the Assistant Chief for the City of Troy Police Department. 
I cover uh, the patrol division and the training division for the city or city police department. As you can see by the slide, uh, we're allotted staffing of 131 sworn members. The breakdown of that is three chiefs, eight captains, 27 sergeants, and 93 patrolmen. Um, unfortunately, if we were at 131, we'd be able to um, deploy more resources broad, broadly. Unfortunately, right now we're short 26 people between vacancies, sick leave training, uh, academy training, field training, and military leave. Uh, we're literally at, operating about 80% of our capacity. Um, if we could get some of those bodies back to the street, back to patrol, um, it would allow us to diversify and it would also um, allow us to slow down the hiring because that's what happens most of the time. We end up hiring groups of two to three or three to seven people at a time usually due to the academy rolling out only twice a year. Um, now, when you hire three or seven people at the same time, what happens is they all hit retirement age at the same time. So you lose them. And if we lose them uh, in the middle of the academy, that means we have to wait three months till we can hire more people. Um, that's what we're dealing with right now. We're playing catch up. We had a bunch of retirements. Um, we had six in the academy last session. We had seven in the academy this session, and we're still missing two people. So. Um, we're in a constant state of playing catch up right now. Um, our deployment for our actual shifts, the, the uniform patrol that come to your door when you call is broke down as a minimum. You have one desk sergeant working, one road sergeant working, eight patrol officers. And since COVID started, we actually started having an Evans technician um, on each shift coming in to bring us actually up to nine people due to their uh, specialized training and dealing with hazmat situations, especially in the beginning of COVID, when we weren't really uh, knowledgeable, anybody could, nobody really was knowledgeable about COVID, how we wanted to handle things. And they had the ability to wear respirators, Tyvek suits and additional protection that we were utilizing for them. Uh, that's the breakdown. Does anybody have any questions about the breakdown of the, the staffing? If not, John, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, now, for before anyone becomes a police officer, they have to complete our, the police academy. We use Zone 5 Law Enforcement uh, Training Center, which uh, is Zone 5 of New York State. I believe there's 10 counties that are part of it. Uh, New York State Department of Criminal Justice, which is the uh, oversight for all law enforcement uh, training and certification, requires 715 hours of uh, training. Zone 5 Law Enforcement Training Center provides 1,040 hours. So as you can see, it's significantly higher than what the minimum is. And of that training, the officers have to do 160 hours of field training at their department where they're actually doing ride-alongs before they're actually allowed to graduate the academy. And they have to do that successfully. Uh, we've had people that do not make it through successfully. Uh, once they get the uniform on and they're in the car doing the, the work that's expected to them, they, uh, for some reason, believe it's not suited for them or they just really uh, are not up to the task. So unfortunately that's uh, where we lost too, but they get a real real time training before they're out of the academy at their home department. Um, in addition to that, we have an annual in-service that's a minimum of 40 hours per year of training. Um, that covers uh, all the training for lethal, less lethal equipment used by officers, legal updates, this year, we were also doing veterans in crisis, procedural justice, uh, our use of force documentation, peer support team. We're the Rensselaer County Health Department there, and we also covered civil disturbance. In the past, we've done autism awareness, evidence packaging, um, the medical license death investigators, Narcan, opioid overdosing, uh, leadership, and elder abuse. We try to make our uh, in-service training diverse as possible, bringing in community uh, team members and support to make sure our officers have a broad uh, exposure to all different aspects that they're required to know about. Um, on top of the training that we provide our officers with the minimum of 40 hours and the academy, we also send our officers to uh, training outside or we host training. Um, a lot of times we send officers that are certified as instructors so they can bring that training back to the department. 2020 was a, um, a slow year since a lot of the training got shut down or canceled. Uh, they just started to 
the end of 2020 to start Zoom, doing Zoom training. Um, and we're anticipating actually as 2021 rolls around, in-person training will start taking place again. Uh, but some of the trainings we sent people to in 2020 include uh, school shooting prevention, leadership forums, our evidence technicians, um, explosive detection for our canine officers, uh, bicycle schools, uh, instructor development, PTSD training, uh, supervisor school, uh, field training officers school, and emotion disturbed persons response team, which uh, we'll be doing again twice this year, I believe. Does anybody have questions about the training before I move on to the next slide? Uh, yes, I have a um, question about the training. Yes. Um, now, do, I didn't hear um, training for implicit bias. Do you have training for that? Uh, actually, that's covered in procedural justice. It's uh, been folded into it. Implicit bias was the first generation. Procedural justice includes uh, implicit bias. Um, that's from the state of New York. That's their um, program and their lesson plan through Department of Criminal Justice Services in New York State. Is, is there um, information about that online, the lesson plan, what, what it covers? Um, that lesson plan is provided by the state, what is covered. Um, the state provides training to our instructors and that is brought back to the department. I personally do not have that. Uh, it, it's gotta be available through the state though. Okay, thank you. Yep, anything else before I move on? John, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I would like to take note of the very first uh, statement, the responded to calls. If you look at it, 2020, we hit the, uh, the police department responded 31,251. The previous year is 52,528. So we were responded to 21,000 less calls last year. Um, the belief or thought processes of uh, people weren't interacting with each other, which uh, lessened the amount of um, calls between individuals on the street. Um, there were probably less homes being broken into, less damage being done. There were just less people outside. Um, that's what we relate most of the lack of uh, or decrease in call volume. But the thing to look at more closely is if you look at our mental health responses, even though we had 21,000 less calls, we still had almost the same amount of mental health responses that we responded to. And these are the ones where we actually document reports. Um, and our mental health calls, actually last year for the old ones, we had to take action, uh, <clears throat> represent 3% of our all calls. 78% uh, of them were 941s. That's when the police officer responds there believes a person's a danger to themselves or someone else, and we will take action um, and bring that person to the facility. In Rensselaer County, it's been designated as Samaritan Health, um, Samaritan Hospital, St. Peter's Health Partners, and we bring them up there and they will be taken in and evaluated. Uh, once evaluated, the hospital staff will determine how they will proceed with them. 5% of the uh, 912 calls were 945s, and 3% were 960s. 945s is when a doctor that's designated by the health department will actually determine someone needs to be brought to the hospital for evaluation. And 960s, that's Kendra's Law. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Kendra's Law from 99 when the uh, individual pushed Kendra, um, oh, I can't remember her last name now, uh, Webdale into uh, a subway in front of a train and she was unfortunately killed. And they determined the reason was the person that did that was not on the medication. So they made Kendra's law, which allows uh, people to be brought to the hospital in the event they are not following their uh, treatment that they're supposed to. So we had 3% of our calls with that. 8% of our calls were 2209, which is our uh, incapacity by alcohol. Um, we bring them to the hospital. The hospital will keep them until they are safe to be released and monitor them. And 8% of the calls actually were voluntary where people just wanted to go up to the hospital. They didn't meet the criteria or 941 or um, the 2209 or anything, but they want to go to the hospital. So we give them a drive to the hospital. Usually the department does the transports. Uh, actually 90% are done by the department. Uh, Troy Fire Department did 8% of them and one and a half percent were other, which is usually Mohawk or uh, Empire Ambulance. Um, we are currently uh, reaching out in talks with and going to be implementing more work with uh, Mobile Crisis. 
where we want to be able to refer calls to them. And some of the calls that we've been talking about referring to them instead of having the police officer show up to would be like non-life-threatening calls dealing with addiction, addiction and homelessness. Uh, non-suicidal or homicidal individuals are looking just to talk to somebody about behavioral issues. Uh, youth refusing to go to school, youth threatening to run away. Adolescent children behavioral issues up to age 15 years old. Parent-child arguments related to behavior health issues when there's no evidence of violence, threats of violence, or injury involved. Uh, welfare checks of individuals who have known behavior health issues where there's no threat, suicide, or homicidal thoughts. Um, this is one of the things that's a big talking point right now, having mental health professionals go into calls uh, rather than a police department. And we would like to be able to move those calls that are appropriate to mental health professionals and eliminate the police responding. Uh, as long as that can be done safely for the person that's in need, uh, safely for a mobile crisis, we, will, we are going to do that. Um, we're in the very infant stages of doing it, but mobile crisis and Captain Matt Montanino are very much in talks and the sergeants will be receiving training this Friday. Uh, so they will have guidance uh, and parameters, what calls will be referred to mobile crisis. Um, we really uh, have high hopes for this because sometimes the police officers showing up merely in uniform agitates individuals that um, for no other reason than it's just the police presence. They don't want the police there. So if we're able to lessen the anxiety for the individuals and it can be done safely for all of us, we are all for this. Um, our members have pleaded emotionally disturbed person response training. Right now we have 60 members that are certified, which is over half the department. Um, that includes chiefs, captains, sergeants, and patrolmen. So it's throughout the department, top to bottom, to have this training in the most emotionally disturbed person's response. And we are going to be hosting two more schools so we can up that. Eventually we'd like to get all our members trained up. Uh, it has value and we uh, have seen tremendous uh, benefits from it, including less injuries um, with the people involved, less injuries to police officers. It is just a good program and uh, it's been picked up by a lot of other police departments and uh, we can't speak highly enough about it. Um, that's really most I have on mental health. Does anyone have questions before I proceed to the next uh, issue? Are you going to talk about the domestic incident reports or are you going to go to another slide? Uh, I'm going to talk about domestics in a minute, but I actually have some notes here where I went through all the stuff for mental health. So if anybody had any questions about mental health, I wanted to answer them before I went to. Uh, Kathy has a question. Kathy, go ahead. Kathy, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks. So um, I just wanted to, to make one quick uh, little correction. The 945s come under myself as commissioner of mental health, not the health department. Sorry. So, um, so the 945s um, come through my office and I can designate um, individuals to uh, issue the 945s under uh, my auspices. But um, just wanted to verify um, where the uh, overdose calls are classified. Are they classified under the mental health calls or are they separate? Uh, they are not classified under mental health. The mental health calls are basically the voluntaries, the 960s, 941s, 2209s, and the 945s. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep. Uh, anybody else before I move on to the domestics? Okay, uh, as you can see for domestic incidents, uh, again, there were 21,000 less calls, but we had, um, we had actually more domestics in 2020 than we did 2019. Uh, that's not a big surprise to anyone. Uh, it was on the news that uh, domestics in, uh, incidents were on the rise, and that basically was attributed much to the fact that people were all stuck at home. Um, our breakdowns for numbers are, of the 2,900 or 2,099 domestic pre respond to in 2020, uh, 799 of those had charges that were um, listed on the report by the officer. Depending on what the charge were was, uh, would actually depend on how the um, investigation process proceeded. Because in New York State, there's a mandatory arrest for domestic violence cases. Um, and that means an intimate partner relationship, the police must make an arrest 
when a felony is committed, a person violates an order of protection um, or a stay away order. Uh, in mandatory arrest cases, even if you ask the police not to make an arrest, they must do so. But the police do not have to make an arrest if you do not want them to. When there's no order of protection or the abuser commits a misdemeanor crime. The caveat to that, though, is the police are not allowed to ask the abuser if you, or ask if the, they want the abuser arrested or if they want to press charges. Uh, we can make the arrest if we think it's the best course of action. Uh, mandatory arrest does not always happen right away. It means the police must arrest uh, <clears throat> or even if the abuser leaves before the police arrives. If the abuser leaves before the police arrive, we will file for a warrant or push it to the detective bureau for further investigation. Uh, this is all covered in the criminal procedure law 14010 sub 4. Um, we have a very pro arrest policy for our domestic incidents. Uh, we have a partnership with Uni House. We receive training from Uni House on a regular basis. There's grants funded. Uh, I won't get too far into that because it covers uh, uh, Deputy Chief DeWolf's area of expertise uh, with the Detective Bureau. But we have a close working relationship with Uni House. We do threat assessments um, with our victims of domestic incidents, uh, where we will go through and through this threat assessment that we provided, determine if they need to be um, put in touch with somebody from Uni House immediately. Uh, domestic incidents report uh, accounted for 7% of all our calls in 2020. Um, are there questions about the domestics before I go on to the next thing? Yes, sir. So uh, Chris Burke, Unity House, I, I just wanted to say that you all do a terrific job in this area and I'm really surprised that your numbers weren't even higher um, last year, we served about 25% more uh, individuals in our non-residential and 25% more in our shelter and our hotline calls actually doubled, more than doubled. So I'm really surprised that it isn't even higher, but it definitely is a high workload for you guys and you do a great job. We, we love working with you. you know, thank you. It uh, goes both ways too. And I also believe probably the reason that you guys were getting a lot of calls are you've been around and we've had a partnership for so long your phone number, your hotline number is out there. It's been handed out. And I know a lot of people who were victims of uh, domestics have actually reached out to their friends and provide that information to you uh, to get in contact with you guys. So yes, it's, it, it's a partnership that works. Yep. Uh, anyone have any questions about the domestics before we move on to our next little uh, blurb? All right, the le this uh, next section right here talks about our evidence technicians. The reason I wanna bring this up is because the fact we, uh, again, 21,000 less calls, but we had more evidence uh, collected last year than the previous year. Uh, it just goes to show that 2020, even though the call volume was down, the workload was definitely up. Um, it would be an understatement to say 2020 was a tough year for everybody. Uh, our evidence technicians have really, grown and uh, uh, expanded their, their abilities. They are doing more now than they've done in the past. When I first got hired, we snapped pictures and maybe lifted prints. Now they are swabbing for DNA. They are taking photographs. They are using computer animated diagrams. They use this machine called the Pharaoh that will actually uh, do a 3D picture of a scene. And all that's become necessary now because of what's called the CIS CSI effect, where juries want to see this information. They want to see this 3D thing where the spins around and everything. So our evidence technicians have had to step up their game, and that includes our training. And we've been trying to really get them uh, as much training as possible. And just a heads up on it, the evidence technicians, prior to them becoming evidence technician, they will go through a 40-hour uh, photography class, an 80-hour evidence, uh, evidence collection school, and then they train quarterly eight hours for an additional 32 hours a year. Uh, this is in addition to anything else they go to for training with uh, specialty uh, areas. Uh, and our evidence technicians will respond to homicides, suicides, assaults, sexual assaults, burglaries, autopsies, any other um, incident where evidence, whether it's physical, latent, digital, audio, or video may exist. They are a lot more uh, technology adept than I ever was. Uh, that video right now is very predominant and they are need to be able to withdraw it and uh, they are working quite diligently and 
this just the reason I want to put this in here to show you the amount of time and effort that's going into these cases. Um, going back to the mental, uh, the domestic incident reports, many times there's evidence there and the evidence technicians are responding. Um, and what this also does is when we do have the case, this evidence that they take in, they build, they catalog and are able to produce, it uh, works to get those convictions too. So we can uh, try to break the cycle, especially in the domestics. Assistant Chief, we have a question from Renee. Hello, Renee. Yes, uh, just one question. In, yes. In addition to the training, you just talked about the evidence technicians going through. They go through the academy as well? Yes, our evidence technicians, all that training I just said, that additional uh, 120 hours plus the 32 hours of uh, annual training, that's in addition to the, the 1,040 hours they get in the academy. That's in addition mm -hmm. to the 40 hours they get with the police department. That's in addition mm -hmm. to any schools they go to. So again, that's just more training on top of all the other training that's already occurred. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, anybody have anything about that? Uh, Evans technicians? If not, John, next slide, please. Uh, the use of force. This is something that uh, we have made uh, great strides in this. Um, the state of New York has changed their defensive tactics. Um, their defensive tactics program used to be extremely complicated. It's been simplified to make things more uh, effective. It uses more of a grappling than uh, in the past, which has been extremely complicated. But what we wanna do is point out of those, uh, unfortunately I don't have the 2020 stats because they're still being compiled. Our documentation for our use of force is excellent. Our record keeping is very good. Our ability to extract data is antiquated. It's still done by paper and a person going through and actually counting numbers. So unfortunately I don't have my 2020 stats uh, yet. They're still being compiled, but I do have 2019. And uh, the use of force is less than one half of a percent of the calls responded to in 2019. That means one, less than one half of 1% um, we had to use force, just to put it in perspective. Um, of the 219 total incidents that required force, there were 217. Of those 217, an injury for the suspect was noted 24 times. Now, I need to point out that an injury is classified as a complaint of pain, a scratch, um, uh, anything. Uh, the majority of them are last abrasions and uh, complaints of pain. Um, the reason I feel it's important is so you can see that the, the numbers are quite low and the that's reflective of our training. Our officers are really trained on how to do things appropriately um, and minimize the danger to everybody, the, the individual force being used upon and the officers themselves. Um, you know, go on to the days of uh, punching because it does two things. It's not very effective and officers get hurt. Uh, the new techniques that the state of New York's pushed down and our defensive tax instructors have started have made a huge difference. Things are running much better and all the injury levels have decreased dramatically. Um, the other one I have on here is canine stats, but I'm sure that... Um, Oh, what, what else I do want to say? Uh, all our use of forces, uh, the majority are in the patrol division, the guys that I cover, are uh, reviewed by the sergeant that's working, and then they're approved by a captain. Then every single use of force is uh, for, sent to the use of force committee that's made up of use of force instructors, including firearms, tasers, canines, defensive tactics, pepper ball, and the captains that are in charge of training and special services. Um, the use of force committee members are emailed every use of force. If there's a concern with any uses of force, a member of the committee will speak with the officer on their next work day for clarif clarification or potential training. Once a month, they meet to discuss the monthly reports and see if adjustments or training or, pol or policy need to occur. Um, I also, I know the other chiefs personally review all our use of forces. And if we have any concerns, we bring it to the members immediately. It's something we take very seriously, and it is uh, reviewed by a broad uh, number of people, uh, instructors and command staff. Um, 
I'm sure there's a question or two about the use of force. Um, so why don't you, uh, I'll open that up. Does anyone have a question at this time? Do, do, do you have any stats on um, the percentage of uh, suspected injuries or use of force where there was, uh, where race is involved? Do you have any breakdown that way? No, again, unfortunately, um, again, our use of force documentation, excellent. And it is on the form. Um, so we know the, the person that the use forces was the use of force was against. We had that information on the form. Um, again, though, the extraction method is somebody going through with it, literally pulling the information out. We are currently working um, on a program that will track this. So we will be able to extract this information. And when I say working on it, I mean, I wanna have something that's done and up and running uh, prior to spring. We started looking at uh, a LEFTA program and then there was another program that they looked at. And we decided before we like commit to anything, we actually reached out to departments and uh, they, other departments have actually directed us to a, a third program because the first two I mentioned were actually like first generation. And the one that they're talking to about now is actually the, the most current and the, um, it's user-friendly and it allows you to extract information very well. And it allows us to track things too, by officer, by use of force, by suspect information, um, ethnicity, all that stuff, which we definitely want to be able to have and provide. Um, so my, my goal is prior to spring starting to have that information. Um, because as of right now, I had guys that were literally looking at reports, you know, going back 10 years, page after page after page. And as you can see for 2019, somebody sat down and reviewed every five page report for that was submitted in 2019 to come up with these numbers that we have here. So unfortunately, again, record keeping, uh, documentation excellent, record keeping good, ability to extract data poor. All right, we have a question from Renee. Hi Renee. Or Chris, Hi. do you have a follow up before we go to Renee? Nope. Uh, no, no, thank oh, you. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Renee, you're up. Okay. So you answered part of my question. I was going to ask is all of this data on paper, um, and it sounds like it is. Do you have plans of, of um, uh, making that past data electronic? I'm sorry. Say that again, please. Do you have plans of uh, putting that old data into a database so that you can analyze it? and do some sort of comparison. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's the program that we're hoping to get that will allow us to do that. Um, it's just a matter of finding the right program and actually purchasing it. And as we all know, that computer programs are not cheap. Uh, fortunately, that's not gonna be an issue with us. This is something that we both agree upon that we need to have. Um, we can't keep going with paper, um, data so, record keeping because it's not it's not efficient when we're looking to find out uh information go back and look at it right so right now when when you do a report or when something happens it's, it's done by, on paper yes ma'am okay thank you yep does anybody have a question about that uh the next part we're going to The next part uh, of this is the canine statistics. Um, the canines Chris, were, yes. I, I'm so sorry, Tamara. That's okay. I, sorry, um, very, very quick question. You mentioned a use of force committee. Who's on that? That, uh, Thank is, you. that is all our uh, use of force uh, instructors. Um, I'm going to leave names off because I'm I definitely am sure I'm going to forget it, but it includes, uh, Captain Kiley, who's in uh, special services, it includes Captain Becker, who is our training captain. It includes Sergeant Keeler, who is our lead defensive tactics instructor. It includes firearms instructors, it includes the uh, canine handlers. It includes pepper ball taser instructors. Uh, any and all our use of force members are on the committee and everybody reviews it. So there's, without exaggeration, we're looking at for, eight, 12, no less than 20 people 
uh, on top of the sergeant and the captain that are actually working the shift are also looking at these uh, reports to make sure that they're A, done properly and the actions are appropriate. Um, and if there's something that raises any question, it's addressed immediately. It's, it's not wait. We don't wait till the meeting happens that month or anything. It's it will be addressed immediately. Um, if I have my concerns, I bring it to the cap, the training captain, who will look into it. Um, if, and any member of the committee, which is patrolmen in it, sergeants and captains, any member can raise a question or have a concern and take action on it. This is one thing where the rank doesn't matter. They are all subject matter experts. They're certified instructors through a state and certified instructors in their specialty. So if there's a question, a concern or a problem, uh, actions taken at that time. Thank you. Yep. The last part is a canine uh, stats. We have five canines. Uh, last year, uh, there are 235 canine deployments. Of that, 158 were for patrol reasons. Usually that's um, the big one is building searches. Uh, the dog has the ability to obviously go through a building and locate a per person much better and more efficiently than we can ever do. Um, their, their scent ability is unmatched. It's, it's what they were built for almost. Um, tracking, there were 18 tracks done last year. Uh, there were 20 narcotic searches and 57 explosive searches. Um, and nine demonstrations were done. Uh, we, we try to have the demonstrations out there um, whenever we can. Obviously, COVID really knocked us down last year. Uh, the year before, we actually had probably uh, 15 of them. And we also, uh, being the largest agency in the county we uh, and having the dogs, we spend a lot of time assisting other agencies. And it's not just county agencies. Uh, we go to Albany County, Rensselaer County. Uh, we've gone as far as Columbia County. We'll head over to Saratoga County. Uh, if agent calls and requests a dog and we have one working, we, uh, we give them that resource. Um, the apprehensions that's on the, um, uh, the PowerPoint, there were two apprehensions. And what that may means is the dog actually engaged. Um, of those two, that accounts for 0.8%, so less than 1% of the 235 times a dog was deployed, uh, they actually engaged the person. Um, Assistant Chief, we have another question. Renee, yes. did you wanna? Yeah, I just wanted to um, follow up on what um, Carmela was asking about use of force. Yes. I just wanted to ask what, um, what is the, the most prevalent type of issue dealing with use of force that comes up for you guys? Um, I'm not exactly sure like when, when we use use of force or what causes use of force. Well, you know what, actually, Renee, thank you very much for asking. Let me uh, explain this because I, I think I failed to do that. Our okay. use of force, a report is generated for use of force. If it's anything other than me saying to an individual, uh, turn around, you're under arrest, turn around, put your hands behind your back. If they tense up and I have to grab them by the arm, and say, that's it, come on, we're going. Me merely grabbing them by the arm is considered a use of force. I would have to do documentation. Um, if we, um, there's times where we do felony traffic stops or building search and our officers will draw their handguns, that'll be a use of force. Uh, unfortunately, there was a deer hit recently and the officers had to uh, put the deer down because it was suffering. It, it was a really bad scene. Um, that officer that had to take that action with the deer had to complete a use of force. Um, if somebody like tenses up, pulls up their fist and wants to fight and an officer draws their taser and merely draws their taser at him, doesn't use it, um, but that taser is displayed, that's a use of force. So many of our uses of force don't actually involve anything, um, any physical contact at times or minimal physical contact, but all that is use of force. And um, it's all documented. It's time consuming, but it's efficient. And it, it really puts things in perspective. And uh, it, it, like I said, there's our use of the force. There was a, a demonstration where they sat in over on first, in the alley between first and second street where people were sitting, they were um, passively protesting. Our officers that grabbed them by their arms and merely helped them to their feet, that was a use of force. 
Um, so anytime we put our hands on somebody other than just to simply apply handcuffs, uh, that is a use of force. So that's, uh, that even okay. gives you a, a bigger idea that some of those use of forces had zero force involved. And that, that's where that information, be able to extract it would be extremely helpful uh, mm -hmm. for everyone. Did that clarify your question or did yes, I not it, answer it all? No, yeah, it did clarify. I mean, it even gave me a different perspective. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone else have a question about the uh, use of force or the canine statistics? All right, I think the next slide is uh, Chief DeWolf. All right, um, Chief DeWolf, uh, Chief Deputy, Deputy Chief uh, Dan DeWolf will be taking over for now. Thanks, thanks Chris, nice job, Assistant Chief. Um, all right, so as uh, Assistant Chief Keene said, I head up the Detective Bureau, also Community Services, and under that is the uh, Narcotics Division, uh, as well as some ancillary duties. Uh, so last year we had over 900 cases that were assigned and investigated in, in the Detective Bureau. Um, we have 17 detective spots, uh, but of that, 11 of them handle the bulk of the of the cases. Um, two are two officers or detectives. One is a sergeant. One is a detective. Um, is assigned to our defensive uh, or defensive domestic violence unit, which is uh, partially funded by a grant through Unity House. Um, it, it's an OVW grant and, uh, they do a great job. They, they handle a lot of cases. Um, two of our detectives are assigned to the, uh, FBI safe streets task force, which they actually work outside of our department here. They, they work over in Albany at the McCarty building. Um, but they bring a lot back. Uh, so they're assigned over there, but then they have the whole realm of the, of the FBI, uh, at our disposal for help on in cases. So it's a, it's definitely, it's a win for them, but it's a, a bigger win for us. Um, we have two, uh, two people assigned to the juvenile unit, which uh, the sex offender management also falls under that. One of them is a sergeant. One of them is a patrolman. Um, and they handle a, an enormous amount of cases too. Just the sex offender management itself is, uh, is pretty overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of sex offenders in the city of Troy um, of all three levels. So last year, uh, as uh, Assistant Chief Keen pointed out, the, the costs for service were much less. However, it was probably one of the most violent years um, in my 26 years here. Uh, so we had 13 homicides. Um, eight of those were, were uh, gunfire, uh, two stabbing. One was a hypothermia. Uh, one was an asphyxiation and one was an arson. Seven arrests were made so far. Um, uh, one of the on, in one of those homicides, it was a justified. It was the officer involved shooting up on 17th Street, where the officer was off duty and came to the aid of a domestic violence victim whose uh, her her estranged husband was stabbing her, and um, and he he didn't want to he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to have to do it, but he had to do it to save her life, and, and she was very grateful for it. Um, one of the cases was closed. One of the homicide cases was closed by investigation because it actually involved a. Uh, a toddler, um, and it was at the hands of a of another family member that was also a toddler, um, and it was uh, it was a very sad investigation. But it was, you know, it, it was just there was nothing there was nothing criminal. You know, what I mean, it was a, it was a child. I mean, I'm talking like a, a three and a half year old and an eighteen month old. So it was uh, those officers actually actually um, took advantage of, of our peer support support group because it was uh, it was difficult for them and a lot of these cases are difficult for our officers um, and we're lucky that we have a, a good uh, public safety EAP in our in our peer support group um, of all of the cases of all those homicides four of them remain open um, three of them are three of those four are, are promising uh, a lot of good works getting done on those cases and um, and, and we're hopeful that 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 we're going to have uh, we're going to have arrests in those cases at some point. One of those cases, um, Donovan Clayton, uh, the 17 year old boy that was gunned down um, near Swift and Sixth. Um, you know, we've gone to the media. Uh, we, we've we've done that a couple times. There was a nice vigil when his family was here. His his sister was here. Um, 
didn't really generate much information. So uh, unfortunately, we're not making a whole lot of headway in that case. But you know, we're, it's still wide open, and we're still doing everything we can to to find out who who did that to him. Uh, so in addition to in addition to those major cases, you know, there was there was a whole lot of other violence that went on too. Quite a few attempted murders, you know, where they don't get the headlines because the the you know it wasn't a homicide, but but there was a lot of a lot of violent cases that went on, um, and unfortunately, uh, I don't know if it was the pandemic or or what it was. There's there's plenty of plenty of uh, room to blame lots of things out there, I guess, for why the violence has risen. Some of it, some people think some of it's bail reform. Some of it is uh, um, the lack of, uh, well, I shouldn't really say, some of it is raise the age because some of these, some of these kids are, are kids that are committing these, these, uh, these violent acts. And um, while I'm, I'm kind of happy that they're not treated as adults, because I know when my kids were that age, uh, you know, they're, they're easily swayed by a, by a seasoned police officer to, to, to say what they want them to say. You know what I mean? I get that. So uh, I, I'm kind of glad that the raise the age happened, but at the same time, it, a lot of this violence is happening by, by kids. Um, when I say kids, I mean, between 16 and 17. Um, so that, that makes it somewhat difficult as well. So uh, in addition to the Detective Bureau, uh, I oversee the Community Services Bureau. That, that is uh, community policing, traffic, the school resource officers. Um, and, and also in that is uh, two investigators. One is assigned to the ATF, but he actually works in-house here. And one is assigned to the uh, DEA. And he doesn't work in-house here, but he does, he does help with the investigations. But like I said, with the FBI, the same thing with DEA and the ATF. We have one person there, but we, we gain 20 people by having that one person there. So it's a, it's a huge win for the city by us doing that. Um, also under, under uh, community services is the SOS or narcotics division. Um, last year they had, uh, can you go to the next slide, John? So uh, last year, um, they're supposed to have one sergeant, three investigators. Um, with the untimely death of Sergeant French, they actually ran most of the year um, with just the three investigators and, and no sergeant. However, there is a captain that, that is over the, the entire Community Services Bureau, so he kind of took, took the lead on that so that they had some supervision. Uh, they had 54 arrests, um, 33 search warrants, and, and they themselves, that unit, recovered 12 illegal firearms. Um, now, what, what a bigger number is, is that 65 illegal firearms were taken off the streets last year by the entire department. Most of those were in patrol um, and the detective bureau. Uh, that number is 20 more than, than 2019. So it's just, as Chris had said before, like, yeah, the, the calls were down, but man, it was, it was a rough year. I mean, that's a lot of guns, you know, and, and if there's that many were taken off the street, then there's who knows how many that are still floating around out there. So we're, we're doing the best we can. And in those partnerships with the ATF and the FBI and so on are definitely instrumental in us uh, taking some of those guns off the streets. Um, so in addition to, uh, to the guns, there was quite a bit of drugs confiscated, even though, uh, you know, street work was kind of down because of COVID. So we didn't have a lot of street interaction, but there were, there were larger investigations like, you know, where people are dealing from a house and so on. So of that, uh, there was 339 grams of crack cocaine that were confiscated. Now this is just from this unit. So this is not from the department. So the department numbers are, I'm sure much larger because patrol makes an awful lot of uh, drug arrests themselves. Um, 2,775 bags of heroin were, were taken in uh, 125 grams of loose heroin, uh, 24 grams of meth, um, some MDMA, uh, fair amount of marijuana, ketamine, loose fentanyl, uh, suboxone, and oxycodone. So it's a, it runs the gamut. There's, there's every drug you can think of out there, um, unfortunately. Um, we have partnerships with New York State Police. Uh, it's called Vignette. 
It used to be called CNET. So they assist us a lot in our drug investigations because we have such a small unit. You know, like I said, it's only the three investigators. Um, and we also, you know, partner with the sheriff's department and some of the larger investigations include the DEA and the FBI Safe Streets and the ATF. So altogether, um, we work great with everybody. Everybody likes working with Detroit PD because we, there are no egos. It's about getting getting uh, drugs off the street, getting the bad guy, getting guns off the street, and uh, and that's why that's why people like working with us. Um, Deputy Chief, can I just Renee has a question. Can we just go over to her quick? Yeah, sure. Hi, Renee. Okay. Hi, Renee. Hi. I, <laughs> I, I've talked to the mayor about this before, but how does did did the um, incident from last summer where this church was giving out these AR-15s? Does that fit into this this group here? And did they do anything about that? The uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about up there. The, I don't know if it's a Methodist church. I think it used to be up around 116th Street. Um, this group, they they weren't really involved in that. Community policing and patrol was more involved in that. The, the gun giveaway, uh, yeah. while while it was, you know, it it was. Uh, it was odd, but it was all legal. Um, there, there was nothing it, that could be done uh, about it from a legal standpoint. So there were, there were no, you know, we couldn't arrest anybody or anything for, for raffling off the gun or giving the gun away. Okay. But these other guns that you're talking about then are illegal firearms, period. Uh, correct. Yeah. So like, okay. you know, illegal handguns are not registered. They're they're taking off somebody that's committing another felony at the time, or they're found during a search warrant um, of a drug house or, or so on, you know, or a robbery mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that, that pretty much ends it for me, uh, Tamara. So I'm, I'm open for any questions. Okay. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay. So is that the end of the presentation or? Uh... Oh, Kathy's got a question. Okay. Oh, Kathy. It, it's just more of a, a comment and, and a thank you. Uh, I know that we've had a um, number of more challenging mental health situations in the community of late. And uh, I just want to say how grateful our department is to be able to collaborate with you on that. And uh, I know sometimes they take a lot of time, but you've been really a partner in it. And I want to thank you. Thanks, Kathy. We like working with you. Are there any other questions? Tamara, we have one more slide and then we'll okay. wrap up the presentation. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Chris. Um, as you see, the slide represents our total complaints for 2019, 2020. If you see the uh, total complaints, the numbers, and then you see the below the total allegations in uh, some complaints, there could be multiple allegations or violations, or it could be one complaint. So one incident of a complaint, but multiple officers are named in the complaint. And so the total allegations re represent each um, potential violation. And then below you can see um, the conclusions of each of those allegations. I know one of the things that has come up with, I mean, I'll let you look at the, the numbers. If we have questions about the numbers, we can answer that. But I know one of the things that's come up about um, the availability or the uh, simplification of the uh, complaint process. Captain Shane Kiley, he's our Inspectional Services Bureau captain. He's just recently completed some advanced training. Uh, he's only been in the position for a few months but he's already uh, revised the draft policy for the complaint process. Uh, he has a flyer on how to, you know, actually go through the steps of filing a complaint. We're going to make the complaint available online, uh, both a form that can be printed and completed. And we're also looking to do a, a web fillable form as well. So I know that's come up multiple times and it's actively in the works to the point that we're ready to almost go online with it. So I know that's come up before and I just wanted to, to bring that up. Are there any particular questions about the complaints for these years or in, in general about the complaint process? 
So, so there's a, um, this is a really small sample. So this question might not make any sense, but um, in 2020, there were four complaints that were sustained out of 34. And the previous year, there were two out of 45. Um, this again, a small sample, but that's uh, percentage wise, more sustained, which I wonder if that might be attributable to something you did in terms of the way you looked at these investigations of complaints or anything else, or it's just an anomaly because it's such a small sample. I think it's more that it's just a small sample size. So it's a smaller amount. Um, but, but these complaints can range everything from, you know, the most minor, um, complaint of discourtesy, which is not to say that's a, a minor behavior, we want to correct that, but it ranges from something as simple as uh, uh, an officer speaking to somebody rudely, uh, all the way up to committing a crime. Um, so that's the whole range. Um, again, as Senator Chief Keen mentioned, we do a good job of keeping track of records, but this is another area where our record keeping is all, all the results or all the analysis we have to draw up by hand. So as part of that package of looking at um, keeping uh, records available online for other categories, training, et cetera, we'll also include the special services in that as well. So going forward, we hope to be able to almost instantly or real time pull out uh, data. And then also to the same point that Renee brought up about historical data, uh, over time we'll go ahead and we'll go back and plug that in so we can do more of a long-term analysis of any trends. Council President, did you have a question? Okay. John, that completes the slideshow. If, if you want to stop screen sharing or whatever you need to do there. And as I said at the beginning, it's very difficult in a short amount of time to be able to convey all the things that we do. Um, I guess if one thing can come out of this, even though we just picked some key areas, it, just the fact that now we're talking about it more, maybe explaining it better. And I said this before, we have to do a better job of that. Me, me personally, but our department, we have to do a, a better job for people who want to know more ways to explain that. That goes to Renee's early point about a communications plan. Monica has brought that up as well, citywide, not just the police department. So I think as we can do a better job of explaining why we do what we do um, and how we do it, I think that'll be helpful to everyone involved. Um, are there any I know there's probably a lot of questions, but is there any particular questions we can answer at this point? If there's any questions at this time, Tim, there's just two like uh, things I wanna cover real quick. I know um, there was a caller who asked about a use of force incident the other night, I said he had video. The question was about an officer standing on a person's back. Um, Again, as part of our process, we review all use of force anyway, but because of that, that was brought up, I would just like to address it this time. So the use of force was a, one of our officers did have his foot on the person's back. That was after um, uh, the use of a taser and it was just a means of control. It wasn't bearing down on body weight or restricting any um, breathing or anything like that, like that. It was just to prevent the person from getting up off the ground. The other officer was actively involved in handcuffing the person and so the officer that was standing just used his foot as a means to prevent the person from standing back up or, or rolling away from being handcuffed. Um, and the other thing real quick about PAL, we have looked into that. Um, it's something we want to explore. We've even looked at expanding it beyond a, a police athletic league per se, but more a police activity league so that we can include other things like music or arts or things other that people and young children might not participate in sports. Um, I know there's a lot covered tonight. I know there'll be other opportunities to talk about it, um, but hopefully we can, we can get better at sharing what we do because I think it's important. And a lot of times we don't have a chance or an opportunity to explain it. Um, so we, we'll get better at that. We appreciate the, the presentation. Thank you for bringing that to the committee. Um, I know people were asking Questions. Oh, we've got some questions. Okay, um, Deputy Chief. And I, I just wanted to add. Um, 
because I, I looked into that incident as well. So part of the reason that that officer was standing in that way too, was that he was providing security for the other officer. That was a foot pursuit that had ensued. Um, They're trying to, to, to get to the guy. They ended up tasering him. He's down on the ground while the one officer is, is putting the handcuffs on the other officer. Like, like the chief had said, that there was very little pressure at all. And, and his foot placement was on the lower part of his back. It wasn't like over his shoulder blades or anything like that. Um, and he was providing security looking around because you, you don't want to both be on the ground and nobody is watching your back. You know, you know, the guy has an accomplice, something else is going on. So that was, I just wanted to further explain it. That's all. Thank you, Renee. Okay. Well, I'm glad you followed up on that, um, um, Deputy Chief. So, and I just want to follow through with the, my understanding of what we talked about earlier when we we're talking about use of force. So in this particular incident, the officers would have gone back and written a report and would they have put that piece in there that they had to foot on, on this individual's back? And then how was that reviewed? Is that re reviewed or discussed or what oh, happened yeah. after that? So it was, it, it was uh, as Assistant Chief Keen had said, those reports are flushed out in, in email as they occur, as not as they occur, but very soon after they're, they're, uh, they're handed in um and reviewed it goes out to the committee so the committee gets to see them prior to any meetings that happen so that they you can take immediate action if you need to take immediate action so it was re it was reviewed very soon after mm -hmm. that incident like probably within a couple of days um okay. of that occurring and it's still on the agenda for them to talk at at the meeting that's coming up so it's still, okay. it's still going to be further discussed okay thank you you're welcome let's go to justin and then kevin please so I think the question from the other night, and I, if I'm not mistaken, it was Stephen um, who asked the question. Um, so uh, Deputy Chief, in, in, a, in an event that a police officer needs to use force, it is likely, you know, or acceptable that you would find a police putting their foot on someone's back to provide security or safety can you just like is i think that was you know just in case you know they are watching i don't know if the question was actually answered that he was i think he was asking pretty much like is this okay is this something that we would likely find like you will you may find a police officer having their foot lightly on someone's back for a sense of you know securing them you know so i just wanted to um um get clarity on that because i don't know if the question was was answered okay sure um so it's not the optics of it obviously they, they don't they don't look great um but have but having explained it to you at least at least now you know uh, what really occurred what we teach normally is that you would put your knee down on the person's back so to, to hold them down and then so, as soon as possible, get them into a position so that there is no positional asphyxia because we, we don't want that to happen. This all did happen pretty quickly. So there was no, there wasn't really much of a concern about any kind of positional asphyxia uh, for the defendant anyway, um, but it, it could happen where you would see that. Uh, uh, but you're more likely to see uh, an officer's knee on his back. Um, really, it was just kind of the placement of the officers. They were near a building. The officer who was doing the handcuffing was on the inside. The officer who had this foot was on the outside. Had they been switched, it, it probably, you know, and that officer that was on the inside would have had his back down and he would have been able to see. And then the other officer would have been doing the handcuffing. So it was just kind of like the way it all happened the way it all went down, but it's not, it's not something you would see normally. It, it, it was out of the ordinary. Okay. I think that that provides a little more clarity. You, they are taught to have a knee, but in this instant, in this case, there was the officer's foot that was placed. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Kevin. The question I have, uh, Dan, is uh, uh, just to clarify, um, 
the persons filling these reports out are the officers themselves. Is that correct? I mean, are there, is there often video that could corroborate the self-report of the officers making the use of force uh, a report? Uh, who's filling them out? And, and is, is it typically just the officers involved? If there are no witnesses, those are the only people that are, that are filling it out. That, that's correct. It's normally the officers. However, there's like uh, like Chris had pointed out, it's a five page report. There are room for witnesses. So if, if there are witnesses, there are, they are sought out and their names are put on there and whatever statement that they may have is also included uh, in that report. Um, if, if there is video, great. You know what I mean? And, and with the you know, with the uh, body worn cameras coming sooner than later, then we'll definitely have video. Uh, so that'll be helpful. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Assistant Chief. Um, tack on to what Ch uh, Deputy Chief said. On those reports, we also, uh, there is a spot for video. If we have uh, reason to believe whether somebody videotaped us or there's video from surveillance camera or whatever it may be, um, there's a spot on there to note that. Um, and I'll also there's information for any witnesses uh, that were there present. Uh, their information is documented too, so it can be followed up. Um, these reports are really in depth. And uh, a lot of times we want the video because the video shows all, everything that happened. Uh, again, when this the body cams come, there, it's not something we fear. It's something we look forward to. It's going to show the whole story. Um, so, yes, yeah, so also fill them out. They're quite detailed. We look for video and we also look for witnesses that we can because it, it only helps us um, in what we do in our documentation. Justin. So I just have a question about, um, cause I've seen in several cases where um, um, an event is happening and people from the community are video, you know, taping on their cell phone or whatever, and they're being asked by the police to put, you know, their video away. Like, how does, is that? Um, by the Troy police? Yes. They're being asked to put their, their cell phones away, you know, not to, you know, not to, you know, tape. So is that something that is um, okay um, to act for the police to act of the members of the community? Um, we, or... we, um, we typically do not ask. People have a right to videotape. Our officers are okay. well, uh, well informed about, very knowledgeable. When the cell phone um, videotaping came out in the beginning, um, it became quite normal for us. We actually had, we're being videotaped all the time. We talked to our officers, explained to them that that's, they're allowed to do that. We're in public, that's allowed to do it. We will ask people to step back um, because you know, people when they have phones, they like to get right up close. So they will be asked to step back and maintain a safe distance. Um, other places, other police departments uh, didn't have the exposure and there were some negative effects, but we have now going on, I don't know, eight plus years, uh, well, well known, well informed, our officers know that people are allowed to videotape. The only thing we will do again is ask people to keep distance. We just don't want that phone right in somebody's face because again, um, that's not safe to be that close to each other sometimes. So, and if there's some, you know, with all the videotape going on, if the officer is telling people not to videotape them, there'll be videotape of that. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. So I'm cognizant of the time and we've been asking questions as we go along. You know, you always don't want to shut down the conversation, but is there anything else for this evening? Okay. So thank you very much for the, for the presentation. Um, John, if we could if we could go to the to the deck really quickly, just to we'll just touch on we have another meeting coming up on Monday evening, um, and we have a document that we're going to share with you that we've um, put together, just taking looking for themes and topics that have come out of 
the different affinity groups, the written comments that have come in, and then also um, the public forums. So you'll see this yellow disclaimer over to the left, which says that this is a working document and it summarizes the input that we've gotten so far. And the attempt was to put some themes across the top. And this is based on the listening that we've been doing and then put some topics underneath some themes. And what we'd like to ask the committee to do between now and Monday, um, and we'll send this document to you. John, if you could go to the next slide. We'd like you to look at this and then just be thoughtful about some questions. What would you add to this? What do you think might be missing? Would you organize it in a different way? Do you think there's some topics that could be missing? Um, and then what did you hear that you believe are key priorities in the short term and the long term in these different topic areas? What could you or your agency bring to the table to help support the work? Do you think some things are gonna require funding or resource needs? And then are there things that we need to further study or explore as part of the plan? So if you could take that as kind of some homework as a committee member between, between now and Monday, uh, we would appreciate that. So I'll just open it up if there's any questions before we wrap for this evening. And thank you for staying. I think we had some really good presentations this evening. So we did go a bit over. Uh, Deputy Chief, go to you and then to Kathy. Thank you. Um, yeah, one thing I wanted to bring up that we were talking so much about, about the use of force and um, the documenting of it and so on, but um, I, I want I want everybody to know that obviously our, our goal is always to not use force at all. Like we would we would rather the people just comply and, and we use as minimal forces as necessary to take somebody into custody if if that has to happen. Um, so I just want to put that out there that we we actually we forgot to talk about the fact that we really don't like to use force and we we really try to use it as as, as least as possible. So that's all. Thank you. And then Kathy. Over. Just a quick question. You emailing those uh, last two slides out to us? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. After the meeting, we'll send that to you. And then also there'll be another compilation document with all of the comments that have been received. We need to update that as well with tonight. Thank you. Okay. Mayor, I'll turn it over to you if you have any final. Comments. I'll be quick because we're running so late. I would just, again, thank you for showing up, participating, asking critical questions, and thank you for staying uh, much beyond our um, scheduled uh, end time. Um, but I think it was worth it. Um, good conversations tonight, good questions. So um, here we go. The work starts now. So again, thank you. And good night. All right, we will see everyone next Monday 